Have you ever heard the story about how they train elephants and when they were tiny babies in captivity, they put them on a rope and they keep it and it tries to get away and it tries to get away and then eventually it stops trying to get away and then they replace it with a thin string that could be broken in a second but it no longer strains against the constraint. There are many other animals that do this as well that whether it's the monkey putting the hand in the jar and it wants its, its cookie or its banana and it won't be able to open its hand and so it gets trapped because it's not willing to let go of the banana. The lobster that wants to go and the other lobsters pull them back. <laughs> I don't know about the lobster one. <laughs> no. Maybe that's just in Canada. <laughs> I also know if you put fleas in a jar and put the lid on, they'll jump against the lid, then they'll stop jumping against the lid. You can take the lid off and they won't come, go out. It's also with the lobsters. The lobsters is when you put them in the pot and if a lobster tries to escape and get their claws up there, the other lobsters will pull them down. Why do if they do that? Because <laughs> it's a constraint. It's a constraint. <laughs> if they, if they, if it's, you're not getting free, buddy. Yeah. So chances are Good chances are that our longing, which is neither bad nor good nor here nor there nor met or not met, is um, held by a kind of a constraint that you probably don't know about yet. It is often invisible, just like the lid can be removed and you just stop jumping. And it's because of being hurt and fear. Um, the times we've been hurt before that keep us from moving into the, into the future free of the constraint. And so the next part of this is for you to look at the sort of conditional environment or could be thought of as your worldview, how you experience the world that's around your longing as, as it is. Because... We want to get some information about that because the next part is the deep dive into the mystery of the fairy tale. And so knowing a little bit about the constraints that are restraining you helps to catalyze the alchemy that can happen. Do you want to talk about? So all, all fairy tales start in a beginning constraint. You step into a story. There is a story that exists around you. So um, whether it's, um, it could be even just the simple innocence and longing of the Little Mermaid. Uh, what are some other good The names? iron shoes. The shoes are the constraint. Mm -hmm. The ugly duckling. The wanting to belong. Being in the wrong family. Being in the wrong family. And even the lake itself is a part of the conditional environment in which there's a restraint. Even having to stay yourself can be a conditional restraint. Think of um, Steve Martin in The Jerk when he discovers that he's not gonna become black like his family. He says, you mean I'm gonna stay this color? <laughs> and it's like even just being ourselves, our very bodies, our families, our homes, our health issues, our financial, those are all forms of constraints. But we're looking at the ones that are around your longing and seeing what happens as we journey to how those constraints may shift, open, expand, contract, and reveal perhaps something even deeper than what we once thought. And this might be a little bit like seeing the back of your own head. This might be a little, a little hard to do. You might need people um, around you who can help you <laughs> see the back of your head. Mm -hmm. um, and we're looking for the important pieces in your life, whatever they are, um, that light up in the story. So. Mm -hmm. What relates to your longing? What what's the what are what are the constraints of your life that relate to relate to where you're starting? If you were going to turn your life into a story right now, how do you describe these? How do you describe the pieces of your life that are um, that are uncomfortable mm -hmm. that so are it's a, real? It's the same way as with your longing, right? We we're talking about how our longing can make us cry, right? And you know, like you can feel it. Yes, that's the real longing. It's the it's the things that keep you tethered. It's the things that when you're starting to look at what is it that keeps you restrained from from realizing what that fairy tale mm -hmm. is going to be for you. Mm -hmm. That if you'll feel it in your body and it'll it'll you'll want to cry, and you'll know because it's those things that are underneath it all. You might you might say. 
oh, I can't do it because I have kids, or my kids are in school, or my my brain fell out when I had a, <laughs> whatever it is, right? And you're like, you, and then you go below that, and mm -hmm. below that, you keep on saying, what's below that? What's below that? So that you get to the real piece. And it's it's insidious too. So if you think about, for example, um, we know many people who. Um, were conceived by accident, so to speak, like they, they were told that they were a mistake. Their parents probably didn't mean like, you are a mistake, but as a child, you might internalize, I was a mistake, I was an unplanned pregnancy. That is such heavy duty stuff around it. So then you go about um, constrained by the thought that you are a mistake. The problem is then, you are in a spirit of proving to yourself that you are not a mistake by trying to bring your life on purpose, which is the next logical thing to do if you've been treating yourself as a mistake, right? Okay, now I'm gonna be on purpose, I'm gonna be in relationship with people who treat me as if I'm on purpose, I'm gonna matter in my life. That's just the first layer of self-help, you know? That barely scratches the surface because you're still relating to the constraint of the mistake. Yes. And so you're always responding. And then in every relationship you have, you are enforcing a framework into that relationship as long as I'm a mistake and I'm making sure that you're choosing me because I have to be on purpose, blah, blah, blah. Like that whole thing is the story around being a mistake. So if you don't know about it, then you continue to create patterns, relationships, and situations in which you're still responding to a phrase that you were told that may or may not have really meant what it was, but you made it that way. What happens if you could step outside of even a constraint that's as big as a worldview like that? Like, I don't matter. And, and when you're looking at, so one of the examples that I will use is, is that, say you're five years old and your parents split up. And you, you, the story you tell yourself is, I'm not lovable, so they split up. So you choose situations, right? So whether it's, I'm going to prove I'm lovable by getting 12 degrees and being the smartest person, or I'm going to prove that I'm actually not lovable, I'm going to do drugs and get into bad relationships and whatever. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Self-fulfilling prophecies. And so it's really breaking that apart, right? Like getting the threads and, and understanding what that looks like for you, mm -hmm. that story. Oh. So that's where we're going now. Think of that cartoon with the goldfish. And there's two goldfish jumping out of the water. And one goldfish says to the other goldfish, quick, look down. That's the stuff I've been telling you about. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how it is when you live in the overculture. We're taking you on a deep dive into another place in which those things that once constrained actually turn into tools for transformation. They turn into the choice to burn one's own nest. To choose to look at a worldview that's dominating is part of choosing to burn one's nest and see what wants to come out of the fire. So uh, free write around yes. this thought, right? And, and so one of the things about, um, go ahead. <laughs> um, I was gonna say that we're, we're going to be moving towards doing our writing on this, doing the first step of your fairy tales in the future. So right now, even as you're beginning to free write, begin to play around with ways you could describe the constraints that are around you. Like what setting do you even, like if you were in a mythical setting, where even, where are you? What, what are the constraints? Are you stuck in a tower? Are you, are you headed into the woods? Are you- The underground? Uh, are, you, are you alone and, and sad? Like, wh what, are the, what are the constraints? What is the landscape that you're living in? And when you're doing, uh, so it, this is a piece of where are you now, right? What is around you before you go into your fairy tale? Mm -hmm. And when we talk about free rights, it's really about putting your pen to the paper and not taking your pen off and you just keep writing and one of the things for me that happens is sometimes my mind will go blank when I'm free writing and I'll just write blah 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 until something will pop into your head you will not be writing 20 pages of blah 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 and and that it's just and I actually suggest that you use your body because it's much like it mm -hmm. paint to the canvas you're actually bringing it out of your body and putting it onto paint and you're moving your arms so if that possible do it with pen and paper yeah with all of our free rights okay. do mm -hmm. pen and paper instead of and uh, having said that I also don't want to those of you who won't do that do, do it on your computer or however you do it 
though we are recommending the first pen to paper. <laughs> so go forth and free write. <laughs>